So the final talk is actually from Jesus, which is going to take place during adoration. And it's going to be a one-on-one conversation between him and each and every one of us. And just like the bishop said, you can go to communion and receive communion, or you can go to communion and touch Jesus. So we can sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament and we can waste time. Or we can sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament and we can ask him something and he can talk. The last talk of the day is going to be Jesus. The question is just whether or not you and I are going to be listening. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Father, again, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the chance to gather together as brothers, as your sons. We thank you for uh, the gift of fellowship, the gift of laughter, the food that we've been nourished with, for uh, especially the Eucharist that we've received for the bishop and his word. We thank you for Coach and uh, his challenge to us. Thank you for Jeff and the brothers who've made all this possible. Lord, every man here has a. We are desperate to know it. Every man here has been made for greatness. Longs for greatness. Desires to do something to change the world. That's why you've made us at least for this life. Help us to know what the mission is. Our unique personal mission is. Give us ears to hear you. Give us courage. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in Latin rite mass, anyway, mass ends with these three words, ite, misa, es. Anybody know what that means? It's a good guess, no. What's it mean? Ite, misa, es. Go home, it's finally over, right? No. She sent. That's what it literally means. Go she sent. Ite misa es. Who's the she? Yeah, the church. Who's the church? You are. In a very unique way. You are. You without collars. That's why I love the way the Holy Spirit has created this day with coach's words. He had no idea what I was going to talk about today. But he set up exactly what I'm going to talk about right now. And with the fact that everybody up here, with the exception of the bishop celebrating mass and me right now, is without a collar. Oftentimes what's happening in the church right now is, I don't think this is actually as true in a Chaldean community because I'm overwhelmed by the, the activity that I see in the Chaldean community and, and the life and the vibrancy. Uh, I love what ECRC does. But in, where I'm from, <laughs> the people who, who are doing all the work are, are the people who work in the parish. And the people who sit in the pews think the people in the parish are supposed to be doing all the work. And they're supposed to be actually taking care of us who sit in the pews. That's the work. But actually, the people in the pews, that is to say you, the work is yours in a very unique way. And that's what I want to talk about. So the church right now, Bishop Sample, he's uh, the Archbishop of Portland. He's a dear friend of ours, originally from upstate Michigan, um, the UP. He says the church has got three options, right? This one's simply this. You can just mail it in. Forget it. We don't have a chance. We're wrong. It's never going to come back. So we can just give up, let them run over us. Some people are doing that. I see a lot of people doing this, though. This is the second option. We can build a ghetto. Just hunker down, build a wall, say basically the hell with them, whoever the them are. Sorry, Lord. Right. But that's what we say. Right? 
But neither of these are options. There's really only one option, and that's to engage. We have to engage with the world. The question is how. How is it that you and I are supposed to engage with the world? And I would suggest two things most especially are important. The first is to have absolutely unshakable confidence in Jonathan Rumi. And if you don't know who Jonathan Rumi is, shame on you. Watch The Chosen. We need we had unshakable confidence in Jesus and his lordship. For all the reasons that we talked about this morning, that's we always have to do everything that we do, starting with who is Jesus and what has he done? Because we just can't presume people know who he is or what we're talking about. I don't presume most priests do, quite frankly. So we always have to remind ourselves and to let the, the gospel just penetrate us. This is, this is easy for me. I have a boatload of confidence in Jesus' lordship. This part is not so easy for me. I need his heart. Because when I think about Jesus coming back, like I can't wait to see some people get it. Maybe you're like that too. Like there's some people's faces I just can't wait to see when the Lord comes back. And I don't even know them, most of them. Like they're politicians or celebrities or whatever. And the Lord made this abundantly clear to me maybe about a year ago where he just said that to me. He says, you know that when you think about my return, you want to see people get it. I'm not like that, he said. I don't want anybody to get it. I died, he says, for the ungodly. You're the ungodly. I'm the ungodly. He didn't die as a reward for the good people. So if we're going to engage with the world around us, we have to engage with confidence, but also with his heart. One of the reasons Jesus just gave himself to us in the Eucharist is so that my heart will become like his heart. Which means what? It means when I leave here and I walk outside, I will see those who are lost and I will be moved to do something for them. I begin to see as he sees and to love as he loves and to forgive as he forgives and to act as he acts. So if we're going to engage, we need these two things. We probably need a lot more, but we especially need these. And I would suggest as we start talking about mission, so coach was talking about mission. I want to really focus our attention on the mission of the disciple of Jesus and most especially on the mission of the layman's who's the disciple of Jesus. What's his unique mission? And it flows from rightly understanding what Jesus was doing on Easter. Jesus on Easter Sunday was not showing off. Nor was he simply saying, I've risen from the dead. One day you will too. And I've risen so that I could rescue you from the world. Jesus didn't rescue us from the world. Jesus rescued us for the world. Hear that again. Jesus didn't rescue us from the world. Jesus rescued us for the world. Easter Sunday is the beginning of the recreation of this world, which God loves. So much so that he sent his only begotten son. And one day when he returns, and he will return, and it might be tomorrow, it won't be to take us away from here which I think is how a lot of Christians live. When he returns, he's going to make everything new. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. What's my mission in the meantime? What's your mission in the meantime? It's to participate with Jesus, to cooperate with Jesus in continuing the work of recreation of this world until one day he does it all entirely. Some of us, You probably don't sing it here, but some of us in parishes where I grew up and where I've served, we used to sing a really bad song called uh, The City of God. It's a bad song on a lot of levels. But one of the, the refrain is, let us build the city of God. You can't build the city of God. Only God can build the city of God. But we can build for it. And we're supposed to build for it. 
So we talked about clarity in the mission, this IOT mentality, right? So we looked at Jesus as earlier. God became a man in order to show us the Father's love, to make atonement, to go to war, to rescue us. What about us? Think to yourself for a moment. Don't say out loud yourself for a moment. Jesus sends you from every single mass, after every single time we approach the altar and receive him, out into the world in order to what? Or another way to say it is, do you know what you're supposed to be doing with your life? Because I don't think most Catholics do. I think they have a really reductive, I think I had, and not too long ago, like a really reduced understanding of the mission. And, and we would suggest that it's something like two sides of the same coin. So there's, there's two missions. There's something like an, an internal mission, which is holiness. So think of it this way. The, the enemy, the only real enemy, right? Satan and his minions. All he can do, he can't create. All he can do is deface and twist and distort and pervert and all those kinds of things. He can't create anything. Only God can create. So what the enemy does is he just tries to take what's been created and to twist it. That's what he does inside of me. He does it in my mind, my will, my memory, my imagination. So there's, if you can imagine like me, my will or your will, your life, and see flags flying the enemy's flags flying in a lot of spots in my life still, still. Even if it's only at times. Like every once in a while, he hoists a flag. Anger, resentment, lust, whatever it is. He just raises the flag and he tries to take territory in me. The internal mission is to take that flag down and to replace it with Jesus's flag. That's a real mission. But I think that's what most people know. And I think many people reduce the Christian life to being that. But there's an external mission too. So if you were to see something like a, a map of the country or of the world or of different occupations, could be football, could be teaching, could be law, could be politics, could be education, could be um, medicine could be a whole host of things, family life. The enemy's flags flying in those areas too. Just like Coach was saying, the enemy has twisted like crazy the importance of sports. Sports is a really good thing. The Christian doesn't go, hey, there's no value in that. We shouldn't do those things. The Christian says, no, God gave this for a reason. What's the reason? Let's use it for that. So the external mission is for each of us in each of the places where God puts us in our lives to cooperate with God in such a way so as to twist back all that the enemy has bent so that it's in conformity with how God created it to be. Jesus says it this way. This is one of the ways to think about it anyway. You're the light of the world. You are. I am. You are the light of the world. People don't light a lamp and put it underneath a basket. Why? Stupid, that's why. That's why you don't do it. It's stupid. It makes no sense. You light a lamp so that people can see. What's the point? He lit you, he lit me, so that people could see through us how to live. That passage that Jeff just quoted in Matthew 28 the mission is not just evangelization. That might sound scandalous. The mission is not just evangelization. Jesus says, go and baptize all peoples, teaching them what? Everything that I have commanded you. Everything that I have commanded you. That's a lot. He didn't just teach us how to pray. He didn't teach us how to go to heaven. He taught us how to have friends, how to forgive, the importance of marriage, the importance of politics, the importance of law, forgiveness. He taught us everything. That's the mission. So the mission is evangelization and recreation. 
So men love to engage. We love to give. The Lord wants to use us like crazy. To give ourselves and to use the talents that he's given to us in such a way so as to recreate this world best we can, even if they kill me. And even if they kill you. So C.S. Lewis in this passage we saw earlier, remember the story of Christianity is the story of how the rightful king is landed, landed in disguise. That's his human flesh. But then he goes on to say this, which I find to be the most provocative way to talk about the mission. He calls us all to engage in a great campaign of sabotage. Jesus says to you and to me, go blow things up. If I'd heard that when I was 18, I would have been in in a heartbeat. Lest you misunderstand what I'm saying, the weapons that he gives to us are truth, kindness, mercy, reconciliation, character, integrity, virtue. Those are the weapons. And the enemy is the enemy, period. But the mission is sabotage. God wants his world back. And for some reason, he's allowing you and me to participate with him in that. That, brothers, is a mission worth giving everything we've got for. So we, we, the way we try to get our hands around this is to try to break up the mission or the, the sabotage into six words. So Jesus sends us as disciples in order to be agents of, we would say, sabotage or resistance, recreation, restoration, reconciliation, healing, and ambassadors. Different ones of us, most especially of you, at different times fulfill different ones of those. So God puts us in either certain positions, occupations, um, encounters with people to fulfill these things, and in doing so, to recreate the world. But all of us, every single one of us here, we have two different missions, which no matter how old you are, how young you are, how rich you are, how poor you are, how healthy you are, how sick you are, every man here is called every day to participate in two missions. The first is simply this, to be an agonizing prayer on behalf of the world. If you're baptized, what? Priest, prophet, don't answer this out loud. Think to yourself, do you know what that means? Because I don't think most people do. Pope Benedict once said, the church is doing a great job answering questions nobody's asking. And using language nobody understands. And I think most Catholics have heard at one time or another, hey, baptism made you be a priest, prophet, and a king, but I don't think they have any idea what's the relevance of that for their daily lives. What do priests have? No, they don't. What, what do priests have? Priests have access. Nobody in the Old Testament, I mean nobody, one guy, once a year with a rope around his waist, in case he died, had access to God. You couldn't just walk into the temple and talk to God, not under the Holy of Holies. Nobody had access to God. Pull out your phone. Try to call the president right now. Like for real, pull out your phone. Call the president. You think you'll get through? Yeah, if he's sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or at the beach. <laughs> Try to call the governor right now. Try to call your doctor right now. Try to call your pastor right now. Think you'll get through? I doubt it. You can talk to God. You can talk to God. God, creator of the universe. Anytime you want. Anytime you want. Skip the middleman. Go to God. Don't take this for granted. 
The situation in the Middle East right now desperately needs our prayers. The situation in Ukraine desperately needs our prayers. Countless situations all around us, whether it's at school or at work, desperately need our prayers. The fact that you and I are priests by baptism means we can go into his courts in agony on behalf of those who are hurting and bring them with us. Please don't take that for granted. I'm in agony in prayer oftentimes about people, but I'm supposed to be in agonizing prayer on their behalf in front of the Lord's courts. Does that make sense? Yeah? So every one of us is called to that. Abbot Jeremy Driscoll, he's a great Benedictine monk out in uh, Oregon. He says this, it's the priest's work. He's not talking about those with collars. He's talking about those of us who've been baptized. It's the priest's work to bring another before God in prayer. And if you're a dad, that means most especially your wife and your kids and your grandkids. No one's prayers are more powerful for their children than their fathers and their mothers. Go before him. So every one of us is called to this mission. There's a second mission that every one of us is called to, which I think is the most difficult passage in Colossians 1.24, where Paul says, I fill up in my own flesh what's lacking in the sufferings of Jesus for the sake of the church. What in the world? Sufferings of Jesus. One thing. My participation. Because it's not if you're going to suffer, it's just a question of when and how. And when I suffer, I can do one of two things. We all can. I can complain and moan, which is what most of us do, especially as men. Or we can say, Lord, I'd rather not have this. But I trust that no more than that was in vain on that Friday that we call good. I trust that this isn't in vain either. So I give you this migraine, this broken hand, this mental anguish, whatever it is I'm going through. I give this to you for those who most need your help right now. So all of us are called to exercise our priesthood by going towards in agony on behalf of the world and to suffer for those who are in need. We used to say in the church all the time, offer it up. I hate that expression. It sounds so passive. But we can unite it. I can actively unite it to his cross and say, Lord, I give you this for them. And I don't need to know how you're going to use it right now. But I trust that one day you'll make it clear to me. Mother Teresa was a, uh, obviously one of the greatest heroes in our generation, our life. A friend of mine used to work with her. He went with her one time into a hospital. She went to visit two guys who were dying. She walked up to the first. She says, you take Russia and you take China. And then she walked out like that was the visit. It was the whole visit. In, in other words, please don't waste this. Don't waste your cancer. Give it to the Lord for Russia and for its conversion. Give it to the Lord for China and its conversion. That's how we need to understand what's coming to us when, whenever we hurt. And we hurt a lot in so many different ways. So let's talk about these. These six missions, which are unique to, to different ones of us at different times in our lives. First, he calls us to be agents of sabotage or resistance. So sabotage, in case you know, we don't remember the definition, is the deliberate attempt to damage, destroy, hinder a cause or activity as by civilians or enemy agents in a time of war, and that's us, because we're in a time of war. We just have to remember who the enemy is. But that's not a biblical word, because that's a French word, and the Bible wasn't written in French. But resistance is a biblical word. And resistance is a synonym to sabotage. Resistance is defined as to take action in opposition to. It shows up in lots of places, but maybe especially this passage in 1 Peter where he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion 
seeking someone to devour, resist him. Now, I used to read that passage and think that what Peter was saying to me was, when temptation comes to you, just don't cave. And there's some truth to that, to be sure, but that's not just what that means. That means, that means take action against the enemy. Oppose the enemy. Do what you can to damage or destroy his work. That's what that means. Let me tell you someone who did that. December 1st, 1955, a woman was coming home from work. She was taking the bus. Because she took the every day to work and she took the bus every day home from work. She was seated in the 11th row because the first 10 rows were reserved for white people and she wasn't white. Bus driver told her to move back when the first 10 rows filled up and she didn't move. Bus driver ordered her to move back. She didn't move. Bus driver stopped the bus, called the police. They arrested her and officially charged her with resisting the orders of a bus driver. Who knew? Woman's name? Rosa Parks. I don't know a city in the country that doesn't have a Rosa Parks. She's especially beloved here in Detroit. Unfortunately, what people don't know about Rosa Parks is Rosa Parks was a woman who was animated by extraordinary faith. This is what she said. She says, I instantly felt God give me the strength to endure whatever would happen next. God's peace flooded my soul. My fear melted away. All people, people, were equal in the eyes of God. I was going to live like a free person. I felt the Lord would give me the strength to endure whatever I had to face. God did away with all my fear. It was time for someone to stand up, or in my case, sit down. And I refused to move. See. Rosa Parks, as an agent of sabotage, understands that it's a demonic idea from hell, which should be resisted with every single cell in our bodies, that simply because of the pigmentation of some people's skin, they're either greater or lesser than others. And we should fight it with everything we have. And she did. God calls some of us to be agents like that. Here's another agent of sabotage. Anybody know that girl? Anybody? Nope, it's not Maria Gretti. It's not Amelia Earhart. Who is it? Dorothy Day? Nope. Germany did a poll, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and the greatest Germans of all time. That's a long time, by the way. And her and her brother came in fourth and fifth. Her name's Sophie Scholl. How many people have never heard of Sophie Scholl? Let me tell you about a hero. Sophie Scholl and her brother Hans were um, students at the University of Munich. They lived during this guy's time. While they were in university, they began to find out what, in fact, the Nazi regime was actually doing. And so at the university, they started to print flyers. Just flyers exposing what the Nazis were doing. And some of them would get on trains and they would travel all around the country and they would put into people's mailboxes the flyers that they printed. And they did it knowing we could die for this. And they did. When she was a junior at the University of Munich, she was beheaded, as was her brother. They founded an organization called the White Rose Movement. She, too, was an extraordinary agent of sabotage. She said this. She said, somebody, after all, had to make a start. Like, coach, tell every kid in high school about her. Because she's a great example of the fact that you don't have to wait to be old, to become a saint, and to do heroic things. What we wrote and said is believed by many others. They just don't dare express themselves as we did. Why? Because we are courageous. No, 
because we tend to be cowardly. I'm afraid of being canceled. Well, good luck with that. Who here hasn't done something? God's got a cancer culture too. Thankfully, he cancels sin, not people. Really. She went on to say, I will cling to the rope that God's thrown to me in Jesus, even when my numb hands can no longer feel it. And to the judge who to be beheaded, she says, you have to stand up for what you believe in, even if you are standing alone. We need people desperately willing to do this right now in a culture that's growing increasingly cowardly. So some of us are called to be agents like Rosa or like Sophie. Others of us are called to be agents of, of recreation. Paul says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. That's really good news. That means we can change. Here's an example of someone who did that. She should be like the poster child for today. She was an atheist, a communist, an anarchist, alcoholic promiscuous. She had an abortion. Twice she tried to take her life. And in December of 1927, Dorothy Day became Catholic. And I don't know what you guys know about Dorothy Day, but I'll tell you what I know about Dorothy Day. I don't think I've ever met a more disturbing person in my life. Here's a veil-wearing, daily rosary praying, daily going to communion praying, radical pacifist who embraced all of the church's teaching. And I think if she and I sat down, we would go rounds on a lot of topics and she would win everyone. Because she would just turn the gospel around and point to a passage and say, but Father Jesus said this, why don't you believe that? I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> You're annoying to me. Dorothy Day and another guy named Peter Morin, they founded the Catholic Worker Movement. They used to, they created houses of hospitality at the time of the Great Depression. We're living right now in what sociologists are calling the new Great Depression. One third of teenage girls last year thought of killing themselves. Seriously thought of killing themselves last year. One third of teenage girls in our country. 50% of 8th, 10th, and 12th graders last year, when they were posed the statement, I do not enjoy my life, 50% said yes, I do not enjoy my life. This is the new Great Depression. Talk to coach or anybody who's going to high school or teaches in high school about the mental health crisis that's going on with our young people, but it's not just young people. We have a pandemic of anxiety and fear and depression. So just like they started houses of hospitality, we need new houses of hospitality for the new Great Depression. We need people who can encounter us as disciples who before they're ever called to change, and they might be called to change, are simply loved. Because that's what changes hearts. You can't bend cold steel. You have to warm it first. Once you warm it, you can do whatever you want with it. The human heart's really cold. They might have heard forever that God loves them. They don't know that. They think you and I hate. You know that, right? The world thinks we hate. They think we're bigots. We don't hate. We're not bigots. But they don't know that. They're not going to know that if they don't encounter our love first. Cardinal George once said about Dorothy Day, she was a witness to how the world is supposed to be and one day will be, as was Mother Teresa. Not everybody's called to be a pacifist. She was. And one day there won't be any wars, for real. She was a witness to how the world's going to be one day. So recreation has to do with people getting remade. Restoration, which is another mission, has to do with systems or structures or professions or occupations getting remade. Easter Sunday, Mary Magdalene's at the tomb. Jesus is risen. She doesn't know that. She sees Jesus. She doesn't know it's Jesus. She thinks he's a gardener. And she's right. He is. He's the new Adam walking around his creation. 
beginning to recreate it. Here's an agent of restoration. Some of us are old enough to remember Watergate. Nixon's hatchet man was a guy named Chuck Colson. He was an attorney, a Marine, an atheist. He once said, I will throw my grandmother under the bus to get President Nixon reelected. It's a bad man. Then he met Jesus, and then he went to prison. And when he was in prison, he's looking around going, um, I don't think our prison system works. <laughs> like, I know we need him. But I don't think this works. So he got out of prison. This is what he said. He says, when I was in prison, I saw the absolute futility of the prison system. There's no way you can take a bunch of criminals, stick them in a dorm where they sit around at night comparing the crimes they committed and how they're going to do it next time and expect to rehabilitate them. It's demeaning. It's demoralizing. It doesn't give people aspirations to do the right thing and encourages the wrong thing. So I got out of prison and I realized this isn't working. And he started a movement called Prison Fellowship, which is now in 100 plus countries and in every state in the U.S. except for Rhode Island for some reason. And this is their mission statement. Get a load of this. Prison Fellowship works to restore America's criminal justice system and those it affects. We help men and women replace the cycle of brokenness that landed them in prison. We advocate for justice reform and activate grassroots networks to do the same. We equip wardens to bring restorative change to their facilities. We care for prisoners' families and help strengthen the bond between children and their parents who are behind bars. And we call the church to lead the way in caring for those impacted by the criminal justice system. And we do it all from a biblical worldview. See, some of us work here in finance healthcare, education, law. And the goal isn't simply to do that work virtuously. The goal is to transform that work so that it's more in accord with how God created it to be. That's why what you just talked about earlier was like as great an example as every guy here could hear. Because Nobody here can't picture themselves going, well, I would love to coach or I would love to teach. Now, how do I do that in a way that changes the culture? Because that's what you're doing. You're restoring something. You're not saying, hey, don't waste your time with sports, guys. You're saying, no, 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 sports is a great thing. Let's do it in such a way so that we can transform people by doing it. Others of us are placed in different positions. But God wants to use us to bend those things back. This is something that we desperately need right now in the church. Jesus calls us to be agents of reconciliation. We are literally at each other's throats in our country right now. There is no hope for this country right now. There is no hope for this country right now, apart from Jesus. Politics cannot fix the problem that we're in. Politics is really important. It can't fix the problem. Law can't fix the problem we're in right now. Law is really important. It can't fix it. It can't fix it because the key to problem solving is to find the problem. The problem is the human heart. Politics can't fix the human heart. Law can't fix the human heart. Only can fix the human heart. And disciples of Jesus should know like nobody knows that what God does best is bring dead things back to life and take people who used to hate each other and turn them into friends. For real. There is no solution for the Mideast right now apart from Jesus. None. The best you can get is a ceasefire. But what Jesus can do is take enemies and turn them into brothers. That's what Paul's talking about here, huh? God himself, Jesus, is our peace, who's made us both one, broken down in his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility. That's a real wall that Paul's talking about. It's a wall that exists within the temple in Jerusalem that says a Gentile who passes this spot is responsible for his own death. 
Gentiles hated each other until they met Jesus. Then they started to lay down their lives for each other. And the effect of that was the Roman Empire got won. There's a guy named Kiko Arguello. He founded a movement called the Neo Catechumenate. He was an atheist from Spain, came to Jesus. And then he started to work in the slums. He worked especially with prostitutes and with uh, rival gangs. And he started to see extraordinary things happen. Prostitutes and pimps reconciling. Rival gangs reconciling, suddenly leaving their old ways behind. And the cardinal found out about this in Spain, in Madrid. He called him in, sat him down and said, what are you doing? And how are you doing it? And Kiko said, I have come to be convinced that people need signs of faith that don't require faith. In other words, things which, even though people don't believe in God, when they see them, they know only God could do that. And he said there's two especially, forgiveness and unity. Only God can enable us to forgive. If you don't know that, you've never had an enemy. I had people do some really horrific things to me when I was a kid. I want to kill them. I mean, I really want to kill them. On my own. But God did some extraordinary things in my heart, and I've been able, every day I have to keep choosing to do this, because every day I remember it, I have to choose to forgive them. Only God can enable me to do that. Forgiveness isn't difficult, possible, without grace. Unity only happens through God. Let me tell you the most extraordinary example of this I've ever heard in my life. Anybody been to Auschwitz? For those of you who haven't, it's hell on earth. It was built to degrade, humiliate, and kill. It's haunted. I've been there three times. I never want to go again. This is the commandant of Auschwitz. He was Catholic. Raised in a very rigid Catholic family. When he was a teenage boy, he went to confession. He thought the priest broke the seal of confession. And so he made a decision when he found out, I will never trust the Catholic priest again. And he left the Catholic church. Then he got recruited by Heinrich Himmler to join the Nazis. Himmler saw great potential in this man. And he groomed him to be a commandant. So he started his career at Dachau one of the concentration camps. Then he moved from Dachau to Sachsenhausen, another concentration camp. And he went from Sachsenhausen to Auschwitz. He was the commandant of Auschwitz from 1940 to 1943. And again in 1945, when they caught him and they caught him, he confessed. He was the only Nazi war criminal who ever confessed that he was responsible for killing people. He said, I am personally responsible for two and a half million people's deaths. He, He wasn't sorry. He just admitted it. One of the first things the Nazis did when they came into certain towns is they would just arrest all the influential people, all the thought makers, teachers, professors, priests. So in Krakow, they arrested all the Jesuits at the provincial house in Krakow. That's a picture of the Jesuit household. They got everybody except the guy in the left, a guy named Father Vladislav Lone. He was the superior of the house. He wasn't there that day. I don't know what he was doing, but he wasn't there. He came home. Nobody's in the house. Nobody came home the next day either. Went to the neighbors. He's like, where'd all the guys go? They said, well, the Gestapo came yesterday. They arrested all the priests and they sent them to Auschwitz. So Father Vladislav Lone broke into Auschwitz. Turned himself into the guards. The guards brought him to Haas, the commandant. The commandant looks at him and says, what are you doing here? He says, you arrested my brothers. I want to die with them. The commandant looked at him and said, you are out of your mind. You don't want to be here. And he kicked him out of Auschwitz. 
they both survived the war. So the British caught the Commandant, beat the living daylights out of him, sent him to Nuremberg, where all the Nazi war criminals were sent. He gets condemned at Nuremberg to death. He gets sent back to Poland to die. He's not afraid of dying. He knows he's going to die. He's afraid of being tortured because he's going back to Poland where he tortured and killed two and a half million people. They send him to this town in Poland. Anybody know that town? Who was born in that town? Pope John Paul II. He was baptized in that little church. They put him in prison. They put Haas in prison around the corner from that church. He's there expecting to be beaten badly. He's not beaten badly. He's actually treated really kindly by the guards who all have tattoos, which means they were in Auschwitz. And he's so floored by the way they treat him that gradually his heart, this heart of a man whose nickname was the animal for how he would beat people, his heart begins to soften. And one day from that church, he heard bells ringing. The day just happened to be Good Friday. And as he hears the bells, he calls for one of the guards and he says, I want to see a Catholic priest. They can't find any that speak German because they're all dead. And Haas remembers the name of the priest he kicked out of Auschwitz. And he writes the name down. And he hands the paper with the name on it to the guard. And he says, find me. That man happened to be praying in front of an image of divine mercy. The only image of divine mercy in Faustina's convent which was not far from this town. So Father Vladislav Lone, whose brothers had all been killed by this man, not to mention two and a half million other people, walked into the cell of the man known as the animal and greeted him with these words. Rudolph, my brother. And he heard his confession. And he came back the next day with the Blessed Sacrament to give him communion. And the guards testified that this man, who was so notorious for what he did to people, fell to the ground crying, received the Eucharist, and then was hung the next week. Shortly before Lone died, he wrote in his diary, Never in my life have I given communion to anybody who received it more reverently than Haas. Guys, that's the most amazing story of reconciliation I've ever heard in my life. When I first heard that, it was as if I could see Jesus taunting Satan, as if to say, you can't even have him. The commandant of Auschwitz, you can't even have him because I have come to attack you and to let all of my possessions go free and out of your control. But the way this happens, guys, is through people like us. We have to take our hands off of people's throats and start folding them on behalf of those who've hurt us. And then doing everything we can to bring peace to this country and this world. If it can happen with them, it can happen with anybody. He sends us to be agents of healing. Whenever town, or whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what's set before you. Heal the sick in it. And say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. This is a command. You and I are commanded to go and heal people. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, all the ways that we're commanded to do it. Jesus has given us authority. Over the most amazing example of this I've ever encountered is my mom and dad. My parents are both dead now. They were married for 66 years. That's their wedding picture on the left. August 5th, 1950. My mom grew up in Gross Point. She was the only daughter of my grandfather. She had three older brothers. They were a rich family. My grandfather used to own the Lions. I used to say when they won, but now we're winning again. It's kind of amazing. I mean, he was the most intimidating man I've ever met in my life. 
scared the goodness out of me. My dad came from upstate New York, really poor Catholic Italian immigrant family. They met in college. My mom's hero was my grandfather, her dad, until one day her brothers showed up at college and gave her some news. And the news was that for weeks, my grandfather was going to work. And on a cold day like this morning, he'd put an extra sweater on on top of his sweater underneath his coat. Or an extra shirt underneath his shirt. Or an extra jacket underneath his jacket. He slowly just started emptying out his clothing until one day my grandmother walked into their bedroom, opened up the, the wardrobe, and there were no clothes in the wardrobe. And my grandfather had walked out on my grandmother. I was having an affair with her, his secretary. This is what they came to tell my mother. My mother went crazy. Hated her dad. Didn't invite him to the wedding. Sent every gift back unopened, every card back unopened. Didn't talk to him for 10 years. They died reconciled, thanks be to God. That's a different story. The point of this, especially for those of you who are married, my dad knew this when he met her. He knew that behind the facade of my mom's, you know, intelligence, beauty, proficiency in language, all the gifting that she had, despite all the ways, because everybody here puts up a facade, right? Everybody here puts up a facade. Some of us just hide better than others. Was the heart of a young girl that was massively broken. She felt rejected, betrayed, abandoned, unloved because of what it is that her dad had done. My dad knew that, and my dad knew enough about marriage to know that God had brought him into her life to be a means by which that wound could get healed. Some of you guys might know the, the Anima Christi prayer. It's a little prayer that, that many people pray. It simply goes, soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, make me drunk. Water flowing from the side of Christ, wash me clean. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. Oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. That doesn't mean, Lord, protect me from getting hurt. It means wherever there's pain, Lord, in your body, place me. Wherever there's a wound, place me so that somehow I can be a means by which that wound can get better. If you're married, you should know darn near everything about your spouse. It's not so you can push buttons. It's so you can heal them. And so my dad made it his life's goal to convince my mom that after God, she was the most important person in his life. She did that, or he did that by how he loved her, how he treated her, how he said things to her, what he did, his work, everything he did, he did in such a way so that that wound in her could get healed. And he did such a great job that when my dad died, my mom's in a wheelchair next to his casket as we're about to walk in to the church at Holy Name. And she said these words to my dad's dead body. honey." Because of you, I know who God is. Brothers, if you're married, you can't aspire to hear anything greater in your whole life than that from your wife. If you're married, that's the mission. What's, what's marriage? It's a sacrament. What's a sacrament? It's a visible sign of an invisible reality. What's the visible sign? You are. Just you as the man, or just you as the wife. To who? To your spouse. To be sure the two of you are to children if you have them, but first and foremost, it's you as an individual to your spouse. What's the invisible reality that you're the visible sign of? God. You want a challenge? Hard to get a bigger one. Finally, Jesus sends us out into the world to be ambassadors. St. Paul says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, 
in entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. So you think of an ambassador, you think of an embassy. What's an embassy? An embassy is the headquarters of a government serving in a foreign country. That's the church. It's one of the best images of the church I know of. We're the headquarters of the kingdom of God serving in a foreign country. We're in occupied territory. It's led by somebody who's the representative of the other country's leader. For the Chaldean community, that's the guy who was just at the altar. That's Bishop Frank. For us here, it's Archbishop Bigman. But by extension, it's all of us. Who's the other country's leader? God. It's not subject to the laws of the host country. This is pretty cool, actually. You go to the U.S. Embassy in Italy, and you're on U.S. soil. You're not bound by Italian laws. We're not bound by the laws of the host country. What are the laws of our host country? Hatred, anger, bitterness, resentment, greed, lust, cheating, all those things. But they have no power over us as Christians. I don't have to give in to those. You don't have to give in to those. I do all too often, but I don't have to. It's lost its grip. And we offer asylum and protection from arrest and extradition. And the greatest example of this I ever saw was that guy. Those of you who are young, you have no idea who you missed in Pope John Paul II. This man changed the world. Fathomable to those of us who are old enough to imagine that the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. It's just unfathomable. The Olympics are boring now. It used to be us against them. <laughs> and they don't exist because of a, a, a few different historical figures, but he's one of the first ones, or one of the most important ones. I had a chance to, I lived in Rome for four years in the early 90s, and I met John Paul, I don't know how many times, because Cardinal Maida, who was the Cardinal of Detroit, because he was Polish and the Cardinal, he used to come to Rome a lot. Let's just say that, like a lot, like every month. And every time he would come, we'd get a call, hey, the Cardinal's in town, you want to go to have Mass with the Pope. And Mass with the Pope and the Cardinal was like Mass, the Pope, the Cardinal, and like 10 other people. So it was unbelievable to meet him in the way that we got to meet him. And the first time I ever met John Paul, so this is a man who was, he spoke, we don't even know how many languages, at least 12 fluently. I speak none fluently, right? <laughs> he probably could, could read or speak another 15 or 20. He was an actor, a playwright, uh, uh, athletic. He was a great skier. He's a mystic. He was a martyr who survived. I mean, this is one of the, this guy's so great that when he's, 80 some years old and he can't stand up straight and he drools. China said, you're not coming into our country because we saw what you did with the Soviet Union and that's not going to happen here. That's how great this man was. And I remember the first time meeting him, the, the experience of meeting him was overwhelming and he didn't say this to me, but this is what I felt like. It felt like a man looking at me going, so let's just be honest, right? So you and I, we, we, we don't have any, we're near the same gifts. <laughs> but you can still be great. So be great. <laughs> like, that's what it was like to meet him. He just felt like really small. And, and he just roused you like, I'm going to, I want to go do something with my life. Like, I don't want to waste it. Don't give in to mediocrity. So when he was elected Pope and then he had mass, these are the words he says, brothers and sisters, do not be afraid to welcome Christ. Do not be afraid. And then look how he talks about all these agents. In, in other words, the mission isn't just holiness, as important as that mission is. Open wide the doors for Christ. Open the boundaries of states, economic, political systems, the vast fields of culture, civilization, development, football. You name it. Do not be afraid. Christ knows what's in man. He alone knows it. He wants to bend it back. The father had a plan when he made it creation. So often today, man doesn't know what's within him. 
in the depths of his mind and his heart. So often he's uncertain about the meaning of his life on this earth. He's assailed by doubt, a doubt which turns into despair. And so we ask you, we beg you with humility and trust, let Christ speak to man. He alone has words of life, eternal life. So Paul says, God is, as it were, appealing through you and through me as disciples of Jesus. What I think the appeal is this, you can defect. People are supposed to walk into that gathering of 200 plus young people on what, Tuesday nights? What's the, what night is that? Yeah, Tuesday nights. People are supposed to walk into that and they're supposed to look at the people who are gathered there and go, oh my gosh, I'll be darned. This is real. These people get it. These people have nothing in common. The only thing they have in common is him. And because of him, they've put him first and they call each other brothers and sisters and they lay down their lives for each other and words, they really mean it. Counter us as Christians and to hear us appealing to them by the way we live our lives and the way we're different, the way we treat each other, something like, you don't have to live in the home of a cruel father. You can come into our house. We'd love to have you in our family. You might have to make some changes, but we don't need to start there. We just want you in the family because we have a good father who loves his children, whose mercy and generosity we have experienced in abundance. And when people see that in the church, they'll be lining up outside the doors to come in. I don't think that's what people see in our churches. I think we look just like the world. Sometimes worse. We talk just like them. We act just like them. We desire just like them. But when it's real, when Jesus really takes hold of us, then the world changes. It's a great contemporary writer. He says this, St. Paul, he saw the church as a microcosmos, a little world, not an alternative to the present one, not an escapist country cottage, not a ghetto, the prototype of what was to come. That's why unity and holiness mattered. And because this little world was there in the world, it was designed to function like a beacon, a light, a candle in a dark place, as Jesus had said. So let me leave you with this, and then we'll let Jesus have the last word. A friend of ours wrote a little book called The Christian Cosmic Narrative. In the last page, he says these words. In the high-stakes drama all around us, we have each been given a part to play, one that bears our name and no one else's. We each have the mercy of God to receive, a self to put to death, a kingdom to gain, a battle to fight, and spiritual enemies to slay, comrades to aid, rebels to win over. The ancient battle rages all around us, and brothers, the adventure that you and I were born for beckons. Jesus is going to be exposed on that altar in just a minute. He wants to talk to each and every one of us very personally. I would suggest that we ask him this question. Lord, what are you sending me to do? I don't need to know the mission for my whole life, just right now. How is it you want to use me with the gifts you've given me, whether I'm married or single, whether I own a company or I'm in high school? How do you want to use me to recreate the world that I live in, my world, my space? And if we ask him that, he'll talk. Because that's what he does. And he wants to engage us 
in the only life that's ultimately meaningful. Cooperating with him in recreating this world. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we're going to be have, or we're going to have to be in front of you right now. We have received you in the Eucharist. We have heard you in the scriptures. We ask right now that you would speak to us very personally. You don't see crowds here. You see your brothers for whom you died, to whom you've given abundant gifts, and for whom you have a plan, a very personal plan. So help us to know what it is, Lord. And whatever it might be, give us the courage to do it. In your great name, we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue.